Good morning, everybody. Most people are horrified when they're told that they are not individuals, or even mostly human. But it's a fact. We are ecosystems with huge communities of companion helper organisms, which are collectively known as the microbiota. These consist of viruses, fungi, bacteria, various other kinds of organisms. But even if you consider only the bacteria, and only the bacteria present in your gut, there are more of them than there are human cells in your entire body. And because they consist of hundreds of different species, the collective genome of all of these organisms, which is referred to as the microbiome, contains far more DNA, far more genes, far more encodes far more metabolic pathways than your own human genes do. It's not surprising, therefore, that if we were to take blood samples from all of you, we would find that in your blood there are a large percentage of molecules that are the product not of human metabolism, but of bacterial metabolism. And every cell in your body is bathed in these molecules of bacterial origin every day of your life. And many of them are powerfully biologically active. Now, how did this peculiar situation arise, and why did it arise? Well, the vertebrates evolved about 500 million years ago and rapidly developed and co-evolved with this huge community of microorganisms, which is much, much greater than that which already occurred in the invertebrates. And these organisms developed and co-evolved with it to develop roles in the development of most organs. For instance, an animal that doesn't have any microbiota has a peculiar undeveloped brain that doesn't function correctly, and they behave very oddly. The microbiota also develop roles in regulating metabolism and brain function and the immune system. And that is particularly relevant today because the immune system, of course, has the job of keeping out the pathogens that want to get into our human ecosystem and disrupt it. So therefore, the immune system has got two jobs. It's got the role of managing or farming the microbiota, the good organisms that you do want, while simultaneously excluding the pathogens that we don't want. Now, this required the evolution of a new branch of the immune system, which, again, the invertebrates don't have. And it's called the adaptive immune system. It's extraordinarily clever, because what it does is it regenerates the repertoire of things that we recognize, things that we can tolerate, things that we decide to attack, de novo, at each generation. In fact, therefore, it's a bit, at birth, rather like a computer system. It's got hardware and it's got software, but in order to function correctly, it needs data in order to develop this new repertoire. So where does it get the data from? Well, the data come from the microbiota itself, but also from organisms in the natural environment, soil, plants, and the kinds of animals with which we co-evolved, animals that we would have hunted or eaten or lived with. And that enables the immune system to develop the repertoire to tolerate some things and attack other things and so forth. Now, the problem is that this is often not working in modern, the modern world. There's a whole series of errors that the immune system is increasingly making. Hay fever used to be rare, but I'll bet there are lots of sufferers of hay fever in this room. And that's an example of a disorder where the immune system is attacking forbidden targets, attacking things it should not attack. It should not be attacking allergens like grass pollen or the neighbor's cat. It should not be attacking your own tissues, as it does in multiple sclerosis or type 1 diabetes. It shouldn't be attacking the gut contents, which is one of the things that's occurring in chronic inflammatory bowel diseases. And then there's another kind of error that it's making. That is that it's failing to turn off inflammation that is no longer required. If you look at these cartoons here, on the left, imagine someone in a developing country who develops markers of inflammation. That's what this red line is meant to show markers of inflammation that you can measure in the peripheral blood during an acute inflammatory episode caused by an infection. But if you look in the United States, or I'm sure at many of you in this audience, and we took a blood sample, we would find biomarkers of inflammation, although there is no clinical evidence of any inflammatory lesion anywhere within you. But background inflammation, persistent background inflammation, is failing to be turned off. Something's gone wrong with the regulation of our immune system. And in fact, that is bad because 
Chronic background inflammation leads to increased risk of heart disease, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, certain cancers, even depression. For instance, children who have raised levels of markers of inflammation at the age of nine are more likely to be depressed or psychotic at the age 19. The same is true for work, government workers in the ministries in, in Whitehall. 12 years after they are found to have raised levels of these, these inflammatory markers, they are more likely to be depressed. So why do we think that these defects are something to do with a, 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 something going wrong in this axis of the microbiota and the immune system? Well, firstly, if you look at these classes of disorder I'm talking about, you find that they tend to have distorted microbiota, that's to say, unusual balance of different species. You find that there's reduced biodiversity, and this is particularly important. It's absolutely crucial that you have a very broad diversity of different species in your microbiota. And you find that the risk of all of these things is increased by antibiotics, particularly multiple exposures to antibiotics. But there's much better evidence, more dramatic evidence. If you take identical germ-free mice, that's to say mice that have been delivered by caesarean section into a sterile environment and maintained in a sterile environment so that they have no microbiota, and then you transfer into them microbiota from a thin human or microbiota from an obese human, and then put them all on the same diet, astonishingly, the animals that received the microbiota from the obese human put on more weight, not quite that much, I have to admit, than the animals that receive the microbiota from the thin human. And it's not just for nutritional things that you see effects like this. Just to give another example, if you take microbiota from a depressed human or microbiota from a happy human and put them into germ-free mice or even just into rats that have had their microbiota grossly depleted with antibiotic treatment, you in fact end up with depressed mice or happy mice, respectively. Now, this sort of experiment, which may seem quite mind-boggling, does, of course, prove absolutely that the microbiota is an important part of mediating these conditions. Now, why is it happening? Well, clearly, the first thing to ask yourself is, where did the microbiota come from in the first place? Well, the microbiota, some of it's transferred in utero, but very little. Most of it, of course, you pick up at the moment of birth. The vaginal microbiota from your mother, and also fecal microbiota. The fact that the anus is close to the vagina is, is perhaps not pure chance. Now, that particular transfer of fecal microbiota to the infant is so important that, for instance, koala bears, where the baby is sitting in a little, um, little marsupial pocket, when he gets big enough, he leans out, leans forward and leans down, and the mother twists her pelvis up and produces a special kind of feces that the baby then eats in all, because it has to have the maternal microbiota in order to be able to do the difficult task of digesting eucalyptus leaves. Dolphins have another kind of problem because the baby is born in the sea. So what does the mother do? She defecates massively at the moment of birth, and this seems to do the trick. Humans don't do that, but they do also transfer some microbiota in the milk. There are bacteria in mother's milk, believe it or not. Moreover, the milk contains prebiotic oligosaccharides. That's to say, molecules that cannot actually be digested by the baby. That's the astonishing thing. But they are digested by the appropriate microorganisms. So they act as a kind of fertilizer to encourage the organisms that you want to have in the baby's gut. And then, of course, you can transfer microbiota by sharing the spoon or sucking the dummy clean and plugging it back in the baby, and you get more from other members of the family. The problem, which is what we're about today, is that in the modern world, much of this transmission of the microbiota is being impeded. Antibiotics given in pregnancy, cesarean deliveries, less breastfeeding, more antibiotics in the early months of, and years of life, inappropriate hygiene. Now, hygiene is not, on the whole, a big factor here, despite what you occasionally see in the newspapers. But inappropriate hygiene that blocks transmission of maternal microbiota to the baby like the mother who, instead of sucking the dummy clean, throw, th throws it away and, and, and gets a new one. That, indeed, is not a good idea. But what about the natural environment? I said that some of the input comes from the natural environment. But, of course, babies left to their own devices, and academics have actually sat watching them without intervening, will consume, it seems, about 20 grams of soil a day. S Sigmund Freud had some magnificently ludicrous explanations for this. But, in fact, Probably all vertebrates do it. And the green iguana you see below that baby there has been much studied in this particular context. 
In fact, of course, by doing this, the baby is not only taking in bacteria, some of which, not, not all of which, but some of which will be able to add to the baby's microbiota. They're also taking in spores, which I'll come back to later, but spores are small, very, very resistant forms of, of certain bacteria that can persist in the environment for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. And so those can germinate in the bowel and be added to the microbiota. Now, of course, farmers are always, you would think, closely exposed to the natural environment, so this should help them. But it depends on how you farm. The Amish farm in a traditional manner. They are people of German origin, just like the Hutterites. They all farm in, in, in America. But the Amish farm in a traditional manner. They use animals for transport, animals to pull their plows. The Hutterites are super mechanized, industrialized farmers. And if you look down the Amish column, you will see that they have much lower levels of allergic disorders. They have higher levels of expression in their blood of genes that are involved with the control and regulation of the immune system. And amazingly, Amish house dust contains microorganisms and so on that if squirted into the nose of an asthmatic mouse, make the asthmatic mouse better. The Hutterites, in their highly mechanized farming, everything is exactly the reverse. They have more allergic disorders and their house dust actually makes the asthmatic mouse worse. So, if you were lucky enough to receive your mother's microbiota and to have lots of exposure to the natural environment, how do you make sure that you hang on to your good microbiota? Well, avoiding antibiotics is one thing. Eating a diet with huge variety is another. Fascinatingly, archaeological sites from 13,500 years ago in the Euphrates Valley revealed that people were eating as many as 190 different plants. How many different plants have you eaten in the last week? And other sites show eating more than 100 different birds and animals. Then there's the question of fiber, often described rather mysteriously in the, in, in the media. Fiber simply means plant cell walls. It doesn't have to be fibrous at all. It's just plant cell walls. But you have to have organisms in your gut that are digesting fiber, which you can't digest, but these microorganisms can. You have to have those organisms there because the products of the digestion of the fiber are actually necessary for your physiology, actually act as signaling molecules systemically in your physiology, and moreover, um, feed the epithelium of the gut, and so necessary for gut health. And then polyphenols, these are sort of plant pigments and so on. I just like those because they also seem to maintain the diversity of the gut microbiota, and the one called resveratrol is found in red wine. Now, if you have lived on an appalling diet, for some weeks, some of the organisms, particularly the fiber digesting ones, might have become extinct. But of course, you can always reinstall them by going back into the natural environment. Um, for instance, the spores. Wherever humans have been, the environment will have been seeded by spores of bacteria that are adapted to the human gut. So if you go back into the natural environment, you can reinstall, just like reinstalling software. And then your microbiota can also pick up genes from the environment. Many Japanese people can digest peculiar polysaccharides found in seaweed. Now, it's not that the Japanese genome contains the genes that encode the enzymes that can digest these seaweed molecules. It's that the organisms in their gut have picked up the relevant genes from organisms in the environment because they've been repeatedly exposed to seaweed. So, now, to summarize what I've been saying, I've pointed out that our microbiota nowadays is under strain and is rather abnormal because of a failure to inherit mother's microbiota, because of diminished contact with the natural environment, and because of antibiotics and bad diet. But now, something new has hit the scene, and that is the arrival of agricultural chemicals, industrial pollution, even chemicals in highly processed food and in personal care products. Because what's beginning to emerge is that many of these compounds, even the ones that don't appear to be enormously toxic to humans in their own right, are in fact antibacterial and are altering the microbiota, not only of the natural environment, but also of human beings. And this is worrying because if we further distort the human microbiota, which is already massively different from that of contemporary hunter-gatherers, then we will have lower biodiversity and further problems with the diseases I've already talked about. And the worrying thing is that it looks from recent epidemiology 
that in countries like India, where there are massive increases, for instance, in type 2 diabetes, it's the factors on the right-hand side there which are hitting them first before they adopt the lifestyle practices of, of, of high-income Western society. So the things on the left, you can look after yourself by using common sense but, and changing your lifestyle. But the things on the right need us as citizens to be vigilant and to make sure that governments investigate and that we really know what it is that we're being exposed to. Thank you.